In our sermon text this morning, we're in John chapter 1, verses 29 through 34, and our sermon title, Behold the Lamb of God. That title comes from verse 29, and John's introduction of Jesus Christ as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, it's important to understand these things, and there's a lot that's packed into that title for Christ, the Lamb of God, and a lot that's packed into his role as being the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. And so we want to spend some time this morning uh, finishing this text, finishing this paragraph that stretches from verse 29 to verse 34, and taking a few moments to review some of the things that we talked about last week so that we can understand these things clearly. As Christians, as someone who's saved, uh, we are to live in light of these glorious truths, and we have to understand them in order to live by them. There's great application for your Christian life in understanding the atonement. And I would encourage you, uh, any chance you get, take time and study the atonement. Study Christ. Study his work on the cross. Study his perfect life. Uh, study Christ, and you'll get great benefit, for, obviously, for your Christian life. Uh, the more that we can know him, the more that we understand him, the more that we're conformed into his image, and the more that we can live the Christian life. We looked at last week, beginning in verse 29, the fact that Jesus Christ is the supreme sacrifice. The supreme sacrifice. And from verse 29, the Bible says, the next day, John saw Jesus coming toward him and said, behold, the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. Now, there are many inferences that we can draw about Jesus Christ from that title, from that description. It points to his moral perfections, that Jesus Christ was sinless. He was perfect. Where you and I break the law all the time, Jesus Christ, in every thought, every word, every deed, perfectly fulfilled the law of God. He was without spot, without blemish. And so in that sense, the Lamb of God, the perfect, spotless Lamb of God, he was sinless. That name, that title for Christ, points to his gentleness, that Christ was gentle. He came first as the suffering servant. And like a lamb is thought to be gentle, Jesus Christ is gentle. Um, he says to take his yoke upon him, for he is gentle and lowly in heart, right? And you'll find rest for your souls. It points to his voluntary offering of himself on behalf of sinners. As Isaiah 53, he was led as a lamb to the slaughter. So Jesus Christ was a sacrifice of himself. He willingly laid down his life for those that are enemies of his by their wicked works, for those that were lost in their sins, dead in sins and trespasses. However, Christ, as the Lamb of God, without a doubt, brings flooding into our minds the idea of sacrifice. The only way that sin could be taken away is through a sacrificial death of Christ. Christ is the only one who could have done it. It was a, a supreme sacrifice in the sense that it accomplished and did over and above all that those Old Testament sacrifices could not do. Now, those Old Testament sacrifices simply served to cover sin, but Christ was a supreme sacrifice. He was a supreme sacrifice in the sense that he brought a full and final end to all other sacrifice. Uh, accomplishing all that those Old Testament sacrifices could not fully and finally accomplish. But he was also a supreme sacrifice by ultimately conquering, conquering sin and death, bringing an end to sin for all eternity. But secondly on your notes, we looked at the fact that he was a substitutionary sacrifice. In verse 29, where John says, Behold the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. That idea of taking away sin means that Christ was a substitutionary sacrifice. Christ died as a substitute to take away sin, to save his people from their sin. Now that means, one, that the Lamb of God would bear the weight of sin, that he would take the penalty of sin upon himself, the punishment, the penalty that you and I rightly deserve. Christ took that upon himself. It's where we get the term penal substitution. He took the penalty. That's Christ's atoning work. But also, the Lamb of God takes away sin in the sense that he carries it away. He removes the guilt of sin. He takes away the stain of sin. And you or I are declared righteous before God if we repent and believe in the gospel. And in that, we saw a picture of Christian in Pilgrim's Progress, where Christian, with a great burden on his back, comes to the cross. And when Christian comes to the cross, the burden just falls off his back and, ro and rolls away. Christ... The Lamb of God at the cross takes away sin. Now, the work of the Lamb of God to take away sin, 
paying the penalty for sin and removing the guilt of sin so that sinners could be reconciled to God is called the atonement, Christ's atoning work on behalf of sinners. That's important to remember, and we'll make application from this, that atoning work, that atonement is specific. It is actual. It's not merely hypothetical. It isn't biblical to say, it's not a biblical statement to say that Christ paid the penalty for everyone's sins in the whole world. It's not a biblical statement. Some people, don't they, end up paying for their own sins in hell, right? So Christ didn't pay for everyone's sins. Some people pay for their own sins. The sacrifice of Christ is an actual sacrifice made for actual people with respect to actual sins. Therefore, the atonement or Christ's atoning work could be said to be limited to particular people, actual people. And we see this throughout the scripture. We looked briefly at that last week. But that must be understood now through a biblical balance, both of God's sovereignty and salvation and man's responsibility uh, to the Lord, man's responsibility. Now, that's abundantly clear in scripture. God's sovereignty and salvation taught very clearly in a passage like 2 Thessalonians 2.13 that says, God, from the beginning, chose you for salvation. It can't get much clearer than that, right? The Lord chose you for salvation if you're in Christ. Knowing then those whom he chose, knowing those that would be saved, called the elect, Christ then dies or atones for them. It's particular, his atoning work, particular to those whom he has chosen. Now, at the same time, it's abundantly clear from Scripture that man bears full responsibility for his sin and is commanded by God to repent and believe the gospel. Man bears full responsibility for sin. If man does not repent and does not believe in the gospel, he's liable for his own sin, culpable, guilty for his own sin, and will pay the penalty for his own sin in hell for all eternity. If he repents... He proves himself to be one for whom Christ died. And we don't know how those two truths fit together, but that's exactly what the Bible teaches. At the same time that God is sovereign, dying for those whom he chose to save, and at the same time, man is responsible, fully responsible to repent and believe the gospel, fully responsible to turn from his sin, put his faith in Christ, and be saved. The Bible teaches both of those truths simultaneously together in Scripture. Now, you have to be careful in the way that we think about these things and careful how these truths impact your Christian life. The Bible also says that those things which are secret belong to God, right? But those things that are revealed belong to us and our children. And so what you can't do and I can't do uh, as someone seeking to follow the Lord, as a Christian putting our faith and trust in Christ is to insert ourselves into the hidden counsel of God and begin to wonder what the mind of God is over those things. Only God knows. God decrees, God chooses, God elects. But it's not biblical or right for us to think to myself or for you to think to yourself, you know, I'm just not sure if God has chosen me for salvation or not. And then to use that as, as an excuse not to turn from your sin or to think to yourself, you know what? I'm having difficulty with this sin. I think I'm a reprobate. You don't know that. The Lord knows that. The Lord only knows that. And most people use that as, as an excuse for sin. I remember witnessing to a man one time. He was um, sitting in his house. I asked him where he went to church. He didn't go to church anywhere. He sat in his living room on Sunday morning. And his thought process was, the Lord is sovereign over salvation. So if the Lord wants to save me, he's going to save me. I can't do anything. And so if the Lord wants to save me, here I am. Lord, I'm sitting on my couch in my living room waiting on you to save me. That's not a biblical attitude. If he thinks that way, he'll never be saved. The Lord commands you. At the same time that the Lord is sovereign over salvation, the Lord commands you to repent and believe in the gospel. And if you repent and believe in the gospel, you give evidence of the fact that the Lord chose you from before the foundation of the world. That from before the foundation of the world, your name was written in the Lamb's book of life. That from before the foundation of the world, your name is engraven on his hand. You give evidence of being one of his elect, one of those for whom Christ died. Charles Spurgeon said this, and it's an interesting statement. Go out and prove your election by your conversion. If you want to know that you've been elect of God, beloved of God, repent and believe in the gospel. 
If you want to know that the Lord has saved you, that the Lord died for you, that the Lord paid for each of your particular sins on Calvary's cross, then repent, turn from your sin, put your faith and trust in Christ. And the Lord has done that for you. Many use fatalistic thoughts of God's sovereignty as an excuse to continue in their sin. We can't do that. So what does it mean then that the Lamb of God, Jesus Christ, takes away the sin of the world? It cannot mean of the world in the sense of every single person without exception. Because there are people right now who are in hell paying for their own sin. It couldn't mean every single person without exception. Otherwise, every single person would go to heaven. And there are those who don't go to heaven. It means everyone in the world without distinction, both Jew and Greek. In the text that we looked at earlier, both barbarian and Scythian, slave and free, male, female, everyone without distinction. The Bible says that he came to his own people. Who are those? The Jews, right? And his own did not receive him. But too many as did receive him, who's that? Jews and Gentiles alike, every tribe, tongue, and nation, right? To as many as did receive him, to them he gave the right to become children of God. Now there are a few applications to take from this. You understand these things, and you think about these things, and you meditate on these things, these glorious truths of the wisdom of God in salvation. There's actual application that can be taken from this among many applications that could be made, right? One, this should be a great source of comfort to the Christian. If you are in Christ, then you can be assured that Christ died for you. Your name is engraven on his hand. Your name is in the Lamb's Book of Life. He paid the penalty for your specific sins, every one of them. When you think to yourself, oh Lord, how I sinned against you, and you remember that wickedness from your past and those acts of sin and how they grieve the Lord, Christ on the cross, shedding his own blood, paid the penalty for every single one of those sins. They've been washed away in the blood of the Lamb. You've been cleansed from that, forgiven, pardoned for all of that sin. When you recollect those wicked, horrendous trespasses against God and how they must have grieved the heart of God, all of that has been paid for by Christ if you're in Christ. So it should be a great comfort to the Christian. Your sin has been taken away and now you personally are numbered among his people, your name engraven on his hand. But also, Christian, should be a source of great affliction now over your sin. When you sin, when you fall into sin, when you freely, willingly give yourself over to some trespass, to some offense against God, that sin, when Christ went to the cross, he paid for sins past, present, and future. And when you sin, that's a sin. That's an action for which Christ paid the ultimate price. It's a sin for which Christ bore the penalty in his own body on the tree. That should be a great motivation toward holy living. Live for Christ. Turn from your sin. Christ paid the penalty for all your sins. Live a holy life. Don't allow yourself to take the grace of God and turn that into licentiousness, an excuse to sin more. Like Paul made the argument in Romans, uh, because sin no longer has dominion, because our sin has been taken away, because Christ has paid the penalty, does that mean we should sin more? Certainly not. May it never be, Paul said. Turn from your sin. For the unbeliever who's never repented, who's never placed their faith alone in Christ alone, Every one of your sins, every one, every one of your blasphemies, every one of your idle words, every sin of thought, every sin that you've committed, every sin will be paid by you personally in hell for all eternity. You'll pay for your own sin apart from Christ. And your sin is stacked up to heaven, as David says. There's so much stacked up to heaven. It's a debt that is unpayable. You're going to be paying for that it, for eternity. It is an infinite, eternal debt that you owe because of your sin, your many blasphemies, how offensive your sin uh, against God has been. You know this to be true. Think on your sins for a moment. If you've never turned from your sin to wholeheartedly, with all your heart, soul, mind, and strength, follow Christ, and you're still harboring sin, you're still holding on to your own life, still holding on to that sin that separates you from God, then think about it for a moment. We all know this to be true. 
When you add greatness or goodness or innocence to someone, you add weight to the sin committed against that one. Now think about it for a moment. It's a sin to lie to a friend, right? But how much more of a grievous sin would it be to lie to a grand jury or to lie to a police officer or to lie to a president, right? Just think about it in terms of that. You may disrespect a friend, but what is it to disrespect a king, right? You may commit a crime against an adult, but how much more grievous that crime committed against a child, right? We all know, we all have this sense of justice within ourselves. Imagine now Christ. There is no one greater. There is none like him. There is no one else. Christ is great. Christ created you in all his power, in all his glory. All honor, all dominion belongs to him. There's no one greater than Christ. Christ is good, supreme in his goodness that toward you and I, who were once enemies of his in our sin, gave his life to secure our redemption. Christ is supremely good. Christ is supremely, infinitely innocent. Never sin, not a sin of word, not a sin of thought, not a sin of deed. And so your sin against him carries in it an infinite weight of offense. It is an infinite offense against an infinite holy God that deserves an infinite punishment, an infinite penalty. You see? Christ is infinitely good, infinitely great, infinitely innocent. And you have sinned against him. That's why your punishment will be infinite your punishment will be eternal. Lastly, Christ's sacrifice, his sacrifice was supreme, his sacrifice was substitutionary, but also it was a satisfactory sacrifice, satisfactory sacrifice. And we begin to see this in several different ways, beginning in John chapter 1, verse 30. First, he is the satisfactory sacrifice because he is the God-man. He is the God-man. In verse 30, John says, this is he of whom I said, after me comes a man who is preferred before me, for he was before me. Now this is the third time. It's the third time in John chapter 1 here that John the Baptist has made this point that Christ is preferred before him. All right, so this is important. When the Lord repeats something like that, you've got to take notice. It's important. All of this goes hand in hand with John chapter 1 verses 1 through 5, where we learn that Christ is the eternal word, the pre-existent one. And this is another way of saying that Christ is pre-existing. John the Baptist is attesting to the fact that Christ is pre-existent because John the Baptist was born before or after Christ? Born before Christ. John the Baptist was born before Christ, but he's saying that Jesus Christ is superior or preferred before him. Now, the Jews had a maxim or had an axiom that anyone who came before was greater than his successor. If you were a predecessor, then by default of your earlier or first birth, you were greater than or superior to your successor, one who came after. Here, John is saying, although Jesus Christ came after me in birth, he was before me in the sense that he is preexistent God in the flesh, eternal. It's another way of John attesting to the fact that Jesus is eternal, and John, who was born first, isn't even worthy to lose his sandal strap. Right? Now, a similar, similar argument is made here by Jesus himself in Matthew 22. And I want you to turn there with me. Matthew chapter 22. Jesus makes the same argument, and there are implications, uh, applications from this argument. That Jesus Christ is preeminent. Although he has come into the world in his incarnation, he has come into the world after John the Baptist, and also with reference to Matthew 22 here. He's coming to the world after David. Look at Matthew 22 down in verse 41. It says in verse 41, while the Pharisees were gathered together, Jesus asked them saying, what do you think about the Christ? Whose son is he? And they said to him, the son of David. So he said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David then calls him Lord, how is he his son? Verse 46, of course, no one was able to answer him a word, nor from that day on did anyone dare question him anymore. You can put yourself in the scene, all right? 
You've got the Pharisees who come to Christ and they ask him a question in chapter 22 to try to trap him in his words. They wanted to trap him so they could get rid of him, right? So they ask him a question. Jesus just thwarts their question, just destroys their wicked reasoning, okay? Then the Sadducees come along and the Sadducees also have a question. Jesus answers that question and just stumps the Sadducees. And then the scribes come along and the scribes come along and ask him a question. He does the same thing. It's like every play that the Pharisees or the Sadducees or the scribes run, they're getting dropped behind the line of scrimmage. The play just fails. They're getting nowhere, right? Every, and the economy of words too with how Christ answers them is just beautiful. So Christ is stumping them. And so the Pharisees go off sort of in a corner of a temple. They're gathered together, probably huddled together, trying to figure out how are we gonna get him next? And then Christ decides to ask them a question. He poses a question to them. The Christ, whose son is he? They said to him, the son of David. Now the Pharisees had come to believe that the Messiah, the Christ, was no more than a mere man, no more than a descendant from David. Some who sat by the river that day and watched Christ might have thought, this is a mere man. Oh, that's because of the carpenter's son, right? Just a mere man. He was not only a mere man, he was far more than a mere man. And that's the point that Christ is going to make here, more than a son of David. But listen, that's one of the reasons that these groups were so angrily against him. They saw the Messiah as a son of David. Jesus Christ took that title to himself as Messiah because he didn't reject any of their claims about him. The multitudes were all crying out to him as the Messiah, son of David. Everybody remember the accounts of the blind men. Son of David, son of David, had mercy on us, right? The 10 that were crying out to the Lord for healing. The, the lepers, son of David, son of David, right? They believed that he was a man and the Pharisees believed merely a man. And Jesus Christ is saying, no, more than a man. The Pharisees were angry because Jesus wouldn't reject this claim of himself that he was the Messiah. And they thought the claim of Messiah was far too lofty for Jesus. And Jesus is making the point that no, uh, this is far more lofty than even you understand this title that is being made of me, that I'm making of myself. Jesus said to them, how then does David in the spirit call him Lord saying, the Lord said to my Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. If David calls him Lord, how is he his son? Now this is a quotation from Psalm 110. Psalm 110. And any Jew at the time would have recognized instantly the quotation from Psalm 110. They saw it as a messianic psalm. And so if you're looking at this quote here, or you're looking at Psalm 110, look at verse 44 here in Matthew 22. This is David speaking, and look at what David says. The Lord, now in your Bibles, that should be capital L, capital O, capital R, capital D. When you see that translated, that is the covenant name. It's a translation of the covenant name of God. That's Jehovah. That's Yahweh, God the Father, okay? So if Jehovah said to my Lord, capital L, lowercase o-r-d, that translates the word Hebrew, Adonai, or in the Greek, that's kurios. It was a common name for Christ as Lord, all right? So you have David speaking and David saying, the Lord God, Jehovah, said to my Lord, Christ, my Lord Adonai, right? My Lord, sit at my right hand till I make your enemies your footstool. Now sitting at God's right hand was a statement of co-equal authority. It was a statement of co-equal glory. It was a statement of co-equal exaltation. Did God not say that he wouldn't share his glory with anyone else, right? And yet Christ is raised to a position to the right hand of the Father in glory. Christ is God in the flesh. Christ is the exalted one. Christ is raised to a position of authority equal to God. Now, equal to God in authority, equal to God in exaltation, but also invincible. God will make all of his enemies his footstool. In other words, every enemy, every single enemy will be under the boot, if you will, of Christ. His boot will be placed to their neck. They are under subjugation to him. All of his enemies are his footstool, pointing to Christ being infinitely invincible, okay? So the point that Jesus is making in Matthew 22, tied to the point that John the Baptist is making in John chapter one, is that the son of David or the son of man is insufficient to communicate the full truth about who Jesus Christ is. He is also the son of God, the son of God. 
Isn't it awesome to think about, back in John chapter 1, isn't it awesome to think about how Jesus exegetes the scripture? Right, Jesus goes back to Psalm 110, exegetes that for them as if to say, you guys should have known this already. Right, this is said in the scripture. Have you not read? Have you not read? And he exegetes the scripture. We're to know these things too. We have God's revealed word in our hands. We're to study his word and to learn of him. We're to know these things by studying the Bible. He expected them to know it. He's saying to the Pharisees, you should have got this. But listen, like many today, the Pharisees came to the Bible with their own agenda. They came to the Bible with their own ideas. And so rather than recognizing these glorious truths from God's word about the Messiah, they missed it. They missed it. They had their own understanding. They had their own agenda, their own ideas, and they were blind to the truth. John chapter 1, back in verse 30, John's basically communicating the same idea. The repetition of John the Baptist continues to serve to remind them and to remind us of who Jesus Christ was. Jesus was God in the flesh, the eternal word. You see a man, but he's not merely a man. And this is critical. This is important to your Christian life. If Jesus Christ was only a man or merely a man, then Jesus is not God and Jesus could not save you from your sins. Sinful men would have no way to become reconciled to God. They would be left without a savior, left without hope. But because Jesus is both God and man, Jesus can save from sin. He is the perfect man, the God man, taking away the sin of the world. Only Jesus, fully man and fully God, could offer a satisfactory sacrifice for sin. But secondly now, it's a satisfactory sacrifice because of God's revelation. Look at verse 31. John says, I didn't know him, but that he should be revealed to Israel. Therefore, I came baptizing with water. It was God's intent to reveal Christ to the Jewish people. That was the reason that John the Baptist came baptizing with water. It was the reason that John the Baptist baptized Jesus Christ in the River Jordan. The purpose of John's ministry of baptism was to make known or make manifest to the children of Israel the Messiah, their Messiah. And then, beyond the children of Israel, to make manifest or reveal the Messiah to the world. In this, the salvation directed toward the nation of Israel becomes a salvation that is directed to the world. And John reveals him. And John, it's interesting, John didn't know him apart from a revelation from God. Israelites didn't either, did they? He came to his own, they didn't know him. The Israelites didn't know him apart from a revelation from God. But the truth is, is that you and I don't know him either apart from a revelation of God. You and I are dead in our sins and trespasses. The Bible describes us as blind. The Bible describes us as leprous. The Bible describes us as deaf. What can a blind man see? Nothing. What can a deaf man hear? Nunca. What can a dead man do? Nothing, right? It, um, the Lord has to give us life. The Lord has to give us sight. The Lord has to give us hearing, understanding. We need a revelation from God to be saved. If you're here today and you've never been genuinely saved, the Lord hasn't changed your heart, uh, you're still in your sin, listen, cry out to God. Don't sit around and wait for some spiritual revelation, or, you know, some zapping to say, listen, the Lord is the source of salvation. It's the Lord who saves. Cry out to God for eyes to see. Cry out for God, to God for eyes to see your sin. Cry out to God for eyes to see the preciousness and the excellencies of Christ. Ask God to reveal to you more of who you are and then to reveal to you more of who Christ is and to save your wretched soul. You need a revelation from God. The fact that that revelation comes from God gives you no excuse in your sin. Well, you know, I'm not saved because God just hadn't saved me. That is stinking thinking, unbiblical thinking. That's thinking it will send you to hell. It's interesting, in Matthew chapter 11, listen to this from Matthew chapter 11, beginning in verse 25, you see both sides of this. It says there in Matthew eleven twenty-five. 25, at that time Jesus answered and said, I thank you, Father, this is Jesus praying, I thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent. Listen to the sovereignty of God in his revelation of himself. I praise, thank you, Father, Lord of heaven and earth, that you have hidden these things from the wise and prudent and have revealed them to babes. Even so, Father, for so it seemed good in your sight. 
All things have been delivered to me by my Father, Jesus says, and no one knows the Son except the Father. Now listen to this. Nor does anyone know the Father except the Son and the one to whom, praise a prayer, and the one to whom walks an aisle, and the one to whom makes a decision for Christ. No, and the one to whom the Son wills to reveal him, God's sovereignty and salvation. But now listen, he follows it up with a statement of responsibility, and this statement goes to you. Come to me, Christ says, all you who labor and are heavy laden, laboring and heavy laden over what? Over their sin, over their separation from God, over the judgment that hangs over their head. They're weary under the weight of their sin. And what does Jesus say that he will do? And I will give you rest. Jesus says, listen, come to me. If you are sick and tired of the life that you've made a wreck of, if you are sick and tired of laboring under your sin, if you are sick and tired of that great backpack of weight that just bears on you, weighs you down, listen, come to Christ. He will give you rest. Christ says in 29, take my yoke upon you, learn from me. For I am gentle and lowly in heart. That's something that you have to do. You take the yoke of Christ on you. It's described as a yoke, but is it burdensome? No. He's taking the weight off. Take my yoke upon you and learn from me, for I am gentle and lowly in heart, and you will find rest for your souls. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. It's a dual truth. God's sovereignty and salvation, man's responsibility. God's sovereignty gives you no excuse for your sin. If you won't repent, it's because you won't repent. If you won't believe in the name of the Son of God, then you won't believe. If you won't follow, it's because you won't follow. And yet he gives such glorious offerings, doesn't he? Such a glorious free will, free grace offering of mercy in Christ. If you'll come to him, he'll give you rest. Thirdly, it's a satisfactory sacrifice because it's attested to by the Spirit. It's attested to by the Spirit. In verse 32, the Bible says that John bore witness saying, I saw the Spirit descending from heaven like a dove and he remained on him. Now this was a, a prearranged sign of God revealing Christ as the Messiah to John the Baptist in verse 33. Uh, refers back to the time that John the Baptist baptized Christ in the river Jordan. And it's a, a supernatural attestation of the Godhead that Jesus is the Christ, that Jesus is the Messiah. Uh, you have the revelation of God here. The revelation of God at the River Jordan was God's audible voice at the baptism of Christ. And you have here also the Holy Spirit descending from heaven, remaining on him. It's all three members of the Godhead, all three members of the Trinity at work together here. It's interesting also that the Spirit remained on him. I want to make this point quickly, that Christ is our perfect example. He's our perfect example in how to live the Christian life. Christ is a perfect example of faith in the sense that Christ perfectly believed in and held to and trusted in the promises of God. He's a perfect example of faith. Christ is also a perfect example of holiness. He never sinned. But how was that accomplished? How did Christ walk by faith? How did Christ obey? He obeyed and walked perfectly, lived his life in the power of the Holy Spirit. Listen to this from Isaiah chapter 11, verse 1. There shall come forth a rod from the stem of Jesse. Who's that? That's Jesus Christ. And a branch shall grow out of his roots. The Spirit of the Lord shall rest upon him. And look at the fruit of the Spirit resting upon him. The Spirit of wisdom and understanding. The Spirit of counsel and might. The Spirit of knowledge and of the fear of the Lord. Now this resting of the Spirit on Christ happened in full measure at the moment of Christ's incarnation. When Christ became man, he had a full measure of the Holy Spirit, strength of the Holy Spirit, right? From the very beginning. That's how Christ never sinned. That's in childhood, you can imagine, right? Uh, Christ grew in wisdom and stature in the strength of the Holy Spirit. But here we see a, a, a representation of that in the Holy Spirit descending on him like a dove and then remaining on him. Christ obeyed by faith, trusting in the promises of God, in the strength and power and the might of the Holy Spirit. You and I are to walk by faith, perfectly trusting in the promises of God, 
trusting in Christ alone in the power of the Holy Spirit in the same way that Christ did. Christ is a perfect example of how we are to live our lives by faith in the Son of God and in the strength and power and enablement of the Holy Spirit. When you fight sin, trust in Christ and cry out to the Holy Spirit for strength. When you battle or you come to a circumstance where you're anxious or worried, trust in Christ. Reassurance from the Holy Spirit. We live by faith in Christ and in the power of the Spirit. Next, this is a, he is a satisfactory sacrifice because he was attested to by the Father. John says in verse 33, I did not know him, but he who sent me to baptize with water said to me, upon whom you see the Spirit descending and remaining on him, this is he who baptizes with the Holy Spirit. John only knew who Jesus was through divine revelation. It's similar to Peter, right? Jesus asked Peter, who do you say that I am? And Peter says, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. And what did Jesus respond to him with? You did not understand this, right? This was, this was revealed to you. It's my Father in heaven who revealed this to you. Flesh and blood did not reveal this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And again, at the end of verse 33, the greatness of Jesus over and above John the Baptist is emphasized in the fact that John merely baptizes with water, but Jesus will baptize with the Holy Spirit. But lastly, he is a satisfactory sacrifice as one attested to by witnesses, specifically John in verse 34. John says, I've seen and testified that this is the Son of God. And John is such a good example of a witness. Six times so far in the Gospel of John, it refers to John the Baptist's witness of Christ. We need to take example from John the Baptist and how we are to witness of Christ. Can't let that be lost on this. It's also interesting that John likely knew him, but he didn't know he was the Messiah. Um, many said at that time, look, there's, isn't that the carpenter's son? They knew who Christ was, who Jesus was, but they didn't realize that he was the Christ. Likely similar to John. Have you ever been to a, um, a family reunion? And you got a lot of people there you've never seen before. <laughs> no idea. One person after another coming up and introducing them. They're like, who are you? I'm your cousin. I'm your cousin. Uh, a lot of people in your family you may not know. Might have been that John the Baptist didn't know who Christ was. A lot of cousins. However, it's likely that John knew him but did not know that he was the Christ. Um, and again, again, John concludes with his desire that in the way that he recognizes Jesus as the Christ, he wants us to do the same through his witness. That through the witness of John the Baptist, we would come to know Jesus as the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing, we may have life in his name. And John has done a wonderful job with his witness. He testified of Christ's preexistence in verse 15. He was before me, John said. He testified of his lordship in verse 23, make straight the way of the Lord. He testified of his supremacy in verse 27. The greatest man born among women is not worthy to even loose his sandal strap, right? He testified of his sacrificial work in verse 29, behold the Lamb of God. He testified of his divine right to baptize with the Holy Spirit in verse 33. He testified of his divine sonship, verse 34. As we continue beyond this point now, beginning next week, John's gospel moves from John the Baptist now and transitions to Christ. And we'll look at that beginning next week. Lastly here, there's a final aspect revealed in that messianic title from verse 34, the Son of God. And that is, point four on your notes, that Jesus is the saving sacrifice. He is the Son of God. As both the Son of God and the Lamb of God, Jesus is the only one who can save. Only one worthy to take the scroll. Only one perfect and sinless. The only one who would be an acceptable sacrifice to God the Father. The only one who could propitiate or satisfy God's wrath against sin. The only one who could bear what would be your eternal punishment. The only one that could bear that in his body at one time on the tree. He was the only one. He must be both in order to save. As both, he is the supreme, sacrificial, substitutionary lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world. The question that you have to ask yourself is that, is he your sin bearer? Has he taken away your sin? How do you know? If the Lord has taken away your sin, has reconciled you to God, indwelt you with his, his spirit, then you're going to see a glorious transformation in your life. You're not the man you used to be. You're not the woman who used to do those things. The Lord owns you now. You've been bought at a price. You are his own. And he has made you, by the strength of his spirit, 
by the purchase of Christ, made you his own special possession, zealous for good works, bearing fruit, bearing evidence, right, of a transformed life. Your great need is fleeing the wrath of God. Your great need is escaping the judgment that hangs over your head because of sin. And we have a great redeemer, a great redeemer who offers himself freely, the Lamb of God, a sacrifice of God, holy and acceptable to God, to take away the sin of the world, to take away your sin, every one of them, past, present, and future, to reconcile you to God, that you might have peace with God, that you might be a child of God for his glory. Amen? Amen. Let's pray. Father in heaven, God, we praise you, worship you, Lord, for this glorious sacrifice, for this glorious truth of the work of Christ, both who he is, what he's done, his perfect life, his sacrificial substitutionary death. Lord, we just rejoice in your salvation. We're in awe of your salvation. And we praise you and worship you for all eternity because of the salvation that you've provided for us in Christ. May we now, Lord, by faith in Christ, in the strength of the Spirit, live in the light of these glorious truths that we might be wholly pleasing to you. We love you, Lord. Pray all these things in the blessed name of our great God and Savior, Jesus Christ, our Lord. Amen.